Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Things We Said Today, our weekly Beatles podcast with myself, Steve Marinucci, Beatles examiner, and many other examiners. And um, across the country is uh, Ken Michaels, host of Every Little Thing. Hi, Steve. Great to be with you. Hi, Ken. And we have this is a first for the show. Um, every time we've done the show up till now, it's just been Ken and I. But today we have a guest. And we're we're kind of stringing things together. We've got uh, three different areas of the country. On the phone with us is Kathy McCabe, one of the producers of Good Old Frida, that that um, the documentary about uh, Frida Kelly, uh, who was uh, a big part of the Beatles fan club uh, way back when. Uh, Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ken. Good to talk to you guys. Great to have you with us. Let me start uh, because there's so much about the film that's that's interesting. There's the the Frida part, you know, Frida story, and then there's the film story, and that's really what we wanted to ask you about. Was how did the how did the idea of the film come about? It's a long story actually, but to cut it short, Frida was an old friend of mine because. Um, from Liverpool. I go to Liverpool a lot. I have a lot of friends there, do business there. And um, Frida and I have become friends over the years. So I was intrigued by the fact that Frida in 50 years had never told her story, never talked publicly. Just even people she worked with didn't know what she had done in her quote-unquote previous life before working with them. And she's so intensely private that that's the way she prefers to live her life, and she's also still intensely loyal to the Beatles. So over the years, I had encouraged her to come to uh, where I live in Baltimore and maybe do some private talks and see how things went. So finally, she agreed to do that, and I had a private talk in my house for about 40 people who uh, was supposed to be an hour long. It ended up being three and a half hours long because she just kept talking and talking, and the people were just amazed at her story. So she got such an amazing reception at that. I did her on a couple of those private talks. But Marco Pitos invited her to come to the uh, New Jersey Fest for Beetle fans in I think it was 2011. She was terrified, but she agreed to do it. And the reception she got at that fest was unbelievable. There were 7,000 people standing up cheering for her and giving her standing ovations. So it gave her a confidence to maybe do something because all along she wouldn't believe anybody would be interested in her story. So once she did the fest, we started talking about possibly a book or possibly a a film because um, people kept recommending both of those at the fest. So Ryan White, who's the director, was supposed to be doing a documentary about Vice President Dick Cheney at the time, and that fell through. So when that fell through, thank you very much, I, I said, how about doing a quick and dirty documentary of Frida? We'll just go over and do it in one shoot. And um, – He said, yeah, I'm available. I'll do it. Well, that was June of 2011, and 18 months later, we're finally finishing up this film. But it's been a long, evolved process and a bit of luck and a bit of Ryan being available that made the documentary happen. So you actually accomplished two great things at the same time by eliminating the Dick Cheney. (laughs) Yeah. I agree. But, um, I, it's really kind of amazing to me that anyone that has a sense of history couldn't understand how important her role was or her stories would be, not only just having worked on the fan club, but also working for Brian Epstein. That's right. She was his secretary and started being his secretary, I believe it was 19, he's either late 61 or early 62, and at that point, this was her dream job, going to work for the Beatles. And she's 17 years old. Mm-hmm. And Brian wow. Epstein picked her. That's pretty incredible. Plus, he picked her, and she lasted for the whole ride, even working for the Beatles after they broke up. 
So she's one of the only people, I think, Neil Aspinall, of course, you know, to do that. And uh, her loyalty and devotion was why she lasted when a lot of other people didn't. She's very modest and just true. This is true. this is not false modesty. This is like, why did they want to, Why would they want to hear this? Well, she found out when she went to that Yeah. There was an article actually that I read about her, and she was interviewed. I think it was in the UK. There was an article mm-hmm. that I that I caught online. This is before the Fest for Beetle fans, and she came across as so humble, and really didn't want to be bothered. She didn't think much of herself. And it's just, it's mind-boggling to me, not only the fact that she has this history with the Beatles, but that angle of the fan club, which uh-huh. is something that's that really hasn't been explored that much, to know right. what went on at the fan club and how involved oh. the Beatles might have been. I mean, that, yeah. that alone is a very interesting subject. It is. And keep in mind, too, she was working for Brian Epstein and the Beatles during the day, and then at night she would go home and work on the fan club out of her house. She would be up till like four in the morning doing the fan club stuff because at that point Brian Epstein hadn't taken it over. It was still a private thing she was just doing and pissing off the uh, postman because too many letters (laughs) were coming to her house. And after the letters, it began being giant bundles of them. So uh, they were coming to her personal house. So that was a labor of love that she did, and that grew to. I think the figure we hear most often is about 70,000 people. And she was the link between Beatles fans and the Beatles in a time before Internet, before, you know, email, everything like that. Everything she did was by hand. She, You know, she wrote these letters by hand, the responses, or she had a little typewriter. But she was just working around the clock on the fan club. And we, the, the, the neat thing now is we have so many people that come up to us holding their little letter that she sent to them or their picture of the Beatles that she sent. And they say that these are all people like my age now and you know, who were around when the Beatles first started. And they bring it up, and it's still one of their most treasured possessions. So when we tell her, that these people are coming up and, and are so excited. We're so excited to get this letter from Frida and the Beatles that they've mm. kept it for 50 years. And uh, she she's just astounded by that. That's really one of the wonderful parts of this story is how how humble and how, you know, how down to earth she is because of what you just described. In fact, some of that stuff I had not heard before, but, but yeah, yeah, it's just amazing that, that she's such a wonderful person and she's, she's, you know, she hasn't, she's still the same basic, I mean, she's still good old Frida, which is a, which is the perfect title for the film. And, <laughs> and uh, how did that, t- I mean, obviously the Beatles or the Beatles use of that in the Christmas um, uh, record helped, but was that where that, the title came from is that yeah or was... in yes it was it was in the very first Beatles Christmas record mm-hmm. and um, in the in it George Harrison says well we haven't thanked our fan club secretaries yet or our secretaries and he gave a thank you to Frida Kelly mm-hmm. and in the background the other three Beatles yelled good old Frida and that that has stuck for 50 years that's how people think of her and you're right Steve that is the kind of person that she is so yep that that was it she was um very upset to hear that she was in the Beatles disc because Sola Black actually came into the office and told her she was in it and she said she was just very worried about what they would have said because they joke around all the time you know so she thought they might have said Anything, you know, but as it was, it was it was quite quite nice and appreciative. That's wonderful. That, that, that's a, a, that story about about Silla Black. I mean, that's a great what a great story that is. Uh-huh. And I'm sure she wow. must be proud all these years that she's really immortalized by the Beatles she, uh, on I, disc. Yeah, I mean, there I are wouldn't people call who it, listen. They, I wouldn't are, call it proud. That's not a word I associate with her. But but I think she's more amazed by it, by this whole phenomenon, as as all of us are, that has continued for 50 years and is still going on. 
Well, she must be aware that there are some Beatle fans in the world that listen to those Christmas messages every year at the end of the year, <laughs> and they hear the name. I didn't know that, no. So oh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that story. <laughs> oh, yes. They definitely get played a lot around Christmas time, for sure. For many people, the only way they hear Tiny Tim is at the end of the year. That's right. <laughs> It's a shame, wow. but that's that's just how it is. Yeah. Without giving too much away, will there be photos or videos of the Beatles that maybe we've never seen before in this documentary? Um, I'm sure there's going to be photos in it because we have Frida's personal collection. Hmm. So she has uh, photos of you know herself with the Beatles, various Beatles, and some pictures from the making of Magical Mystery Tour and lots of pictures of the Beatles, her with the Beatles families because she was um, she was the contact person for them from the office, if you know what I mean, because mm-hmm. they were all so overwhelmed by this whole thing, fans showing up at the door, like thousands of letters coming in. These, you know, Ringo's house, for instance, is very small, and if you get like five giant bags of... <laughs> Of letters coming in, his mother Elsie just, you know, needed help. So Frida would every week, was it every week or every two weeks? I know she went to Ringo's house every week, and some of the other houses it might have been every two weeks. But she helped those families, and the Beatles were really appreciative of that. And uh, matter of fact, things like Elsie would uh, Ringo's mom if she didn't go down to uh, London to have Christmas with Richie, as she calls him, then she would go to Frida's house for Christmas. She and oh, wow. Nice. They were very, <laughs> very close. Wow. Mm-hmm. Are the other uh, members of the fan club, the secretaries I'm talking about, are they still around and are they interviewed in this documentary? Uh, we have one person. Yes, they are still around, quite a few of them. Um, several of them actually donated to the film. And I'm a Facebook friend with another couple of them who are actually writing a book on um, their experiences making Magical Mystery Tour. But there's another girl in Argentina who um, has been in touch. So a lot of them are still around, but we have one person in the film who actually works at the fan club with Frida in Liverpool. And and, uh, there's a storyline there. And um, in June, her name is kind of tells what happened. So, yes, they are around, definitely. I don't, I'm not sure they're all still alive. We know there's another one down um, south of London. So that was quite a crew. And they had to get the, the area fan club secretaries because Frida couldn't do it by herself. So each county in um, Britain had, I guess in, in all of the U.K., had a uh, an area secretary and, of course, the United States, all over Europe, I mean, it was, it was quite an amazing thing that she ran. Very roughly, beautiful. roughly, how many people are we talking about, Kathy? Uh, you know, secretaries or members. Secretaries. Oh, maybe fifty. Uh, I, okay. I wow. don't know if that's accurate, though, to be honest. She does mm. have a list. She has the original list that she hand wrote of all the secretaries, and you'd see one crossed off if you know she had to be replaced or. You know, she left, she couldn't do it anymore, so she still has that. Did Frida stay close with the secretaries, the ones in England? I think, yes. I mean, she, they would report back to her. She was the national secretary. There was only one national secretary, although for a time, that was even split up between Liverpool and London. Tony Barrow um, arranged for that to happen because, once again, it got too big. So there were two women named Ann Collingham and, oh, uh, gosh, I might have thrown a blank on the other girl's name. Oh, Bettina Rose. So the three of them were in charge for a while, but really it was it was Frida in charge of the whole thing. And uh, Bettina was mentioned in the uh, Christmas the Christmas record, too, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, she and Ann worked out of um, London, and it, it's it's – Interesting. I don't think this is in the film, but Ann Collingham was really a fictitious person, which I didn't find out until Frida gave this talk here in Baltimore. <laughs> Tony, Tony Barrow created Ann Collingham because 
they needed one name because the, the secretaries were coming and going all the time. So they needed one name for people to direct their correspondence to and stuff. So when the jukebox jewelry show happened, that was the all Beatles one. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was in Liverpool, the very first jukebox jewelry show that was outside of London. Um, they had to present an Anne Collingham because the Beatles fan club secretaries were on there. So they had to bring this woman in who, who acted as Anne Collingham. It was, it was really an astounding story, and they pulled it off. <laughs> that's funny. That is. That, that's hilarious. I never heard never. that before. You, yeah, you yeah. Tony Barrow's book, you'll read all about it in there. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest hurdle to, to get the film done? Well, aside from talking Frida into it. <laughs> and, really? Uh, Get, oh, sure, because she, like I said, being so intensely loyal and private and, you know, doesn't want any attention and still very modest and just didn't think it was it was even, you know, who would be interested type thing. She had a lot of reservations because it was going to put her out there and her story. So we worked through all that and finally um, – she agreed, okay, and a lot of the reason she's doing this is because she has a new grandson who's now three, I think. So he was one and a half at the time we started the movie, and she, his name is Niall, and she wants Niall to know what his grandmother did in her youth, and that she was Aww. pretty cool in her youth, you know. So that's the main reason that she's doing this. So it's not to get her stories out there. It's for Niall. How long did it take you to talk her into it? Do you know? Oh, it was. It kind of evolved over time, just like whether she was going to do the talks. And, but, you know, I think the conversations happened over about a year. And uh, there wasn't any pressure. It was just like, okay, I, I think the key was when Ryan became available. And it was like, okay, we can really do this, you know. So we started it. Right then, and little did we know, 18 months later, it was still going to be going on. <laughs> Are there but any... it's a beautiful, beautiful movie, and it's a wonderful portrait of Frida and her just unfaltering loyalty and work and devotion and and just her, her whole the way she's conducted her life. It's a beautiful tribute to that, and uh, people that have seen it have <laughs> I even cry when I watch some parts of it. It still gets to me, you know. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people that see it are so excited when they see it. This is really, really good, and they're just so glad that it got made. So, but are the other any... hurdle, of course, is the, the is the financing. So we had to dream, but we had to got to find the financing to it. Yeah. Uh, were there any uh, famous people connected to the Beatles that? became involved or were interviewed for this documentary? Yes, uh, Tony Barrow, of mm -hmm. course. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the people that she worked with, and I mean a lot, have passed away. Mm -hmm. you know, Neil Aspinall, she was very close to Derek Taylor, mm -hmm. um, Mal Levins. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on. So they're not around anymore to have been in the film. I think they would have been because... They worked with her from beginning to end. But um, Tony Barrow, of course, and uh, Billy Kinsley, who is in the Mersey Beats. Mm -hmm. Mersey's, and he has known Frida since back in the 60s. And also played, his band played on the, I think I have this right, his band played on stage on the same bill with the Beatles more than any other band. And by the way, the the last time we talked, you you mentioned his book, and I picked it up. And his book has a great story that um, I wish I had known when I had talked to Pete Best recently that he was there the day Pete Best got fired. That's and uh, he he details the story of the book, and he talks about seeing Pete and um, Neil walk out of the office after Brian had candy him in. And the look on his face, and he said, "He said you had said he didn't remember." Although Kinsley seems to say that they kind of looked past Pete. I mean, their minds were. It sounds, it sounds like their minds were elsewhere. I don't know what where the where the the whole part of that is, you know. But but yeah, that's it's in there that 
that they saw Pete the day, you know, right after he got fired from the Beatles. Mm-hmm. So and also, was, Billy was the one who got Pete playing again and uh, formed the, the very first Pete Best band was Pete and Billy. And they mm-hmm. had a little record out, I think it was called Heaven. And that was when he started playing again. And Billy told me that first gig that they did, Pete's mom was standing on the side of the stage, and when they came off after the show was done, uh, her name was Mona, standing on the side, uh, just crying her eyes out, just saying, I'm so glad that you got my son playing again. Mm-hmm. So nice. he and he, he and Pete are still very close friends. What exactly are the plans after South by Southwest for a distribution of this? Will it be strictly a DVD release? No, it won't be. The first bunch of months, or the first several months, I should say, uh, we're in several different film festivals, although the the South by Southwest is the only one that's announced yet. Uh, there are others that we aren't at liberty to say until they do announce it. So we're hoping for a really good film festival run. Um, Ryan's first film was called Pelada, and uh, it was in 25 different film festivals all over the world, so he's got quite a track record with that, and we're hoping that it will be picked up for as many. So we've got the film festivals, and we've got an agent signed on, a fellow named Josh Braun, who's actually the number one sales agent in the country who's just in love with the film. He's a big Beatles fan too, and so he'll he'll be at South and Southwest talking to people down there who might want to distribute it. So, but that's a that's a long time happening. Um, that's a a lot of discussions and a lot of time. We we don't know what's going to happen yet. We do plan to distribute it not only as a DVD but digitally, like on iTunes. And it used to be Netflix. I think Netflix is gone now. But those kind of things where people can on demand and then uh, get it over to Europe and especially the United Kingdom, too. Right. Mm-hmm. Is it going to hit the theaters, too? Or are you looking at a theatrical run? We're certainly open to that, and uh, that's going to be up to Josh, what he works out. But we're open to theatrical runs and, and art house runs. You know, we're kind of the uh, – you know, I wouldn't call this a skyfall or something. It's not like a big major motion picture, so uh, funded by the big production company. So it might be the art houses that are more interested in this. And of course, right. the big theaters have an art house in their theater anyway, in the multiplex. But yeah, we're we're open to all of those things and uh, talking at this stage, talking to various people. Okay, that's that's fantastic. We wish you much luck with this with this documentary. We're looking so forward to seeing it. And um, we do want to mention that if people want to help contribute to the making of this documentary, there is a way to do so. And the information that I have here is that they have to go to uh, a link. It's called the Southern Documentary Fund. Mm-hmm. What is the, the SouthernDocumentaryFund.org. Yes. Yeah. Right? And then all they have to do is just, um, in the search, type in good old Frida, and then yes. they're on the website. Yes, and those are tax-deductible donations. We always need those. Um, and we we raised money in the beginning through Kickstarter. We had nearly 700 people donate to, you know, anywhere from $1 to $1,000 to um, to help us make the film. At that point, we knew we could make it. We're in the second stage of fundraising now where the post-production costs are involved. And Ryan and I have not taken any salaries, a penny. You know, we don't plan to. So it's only because that is happening and and that fans donated that we're able to make this. So it's almost like a joint project, labor of love type thing. Right. But, um, but the, the Southern Documentary Fund is the way to go, and we're, we're, it's quite a, there's quite a bit of post-production costs, so every donation counts. Please make it, and uh, thank you for spreading the news on the fundraising part. 
So what will Frida do if this documentary becomes huge and uh, her name becomes more and more popular and everybody wants to know her? She'll probably run off to a uh, become a hermit somewhere or something. <laughs> um, she, you know, when she's with the fans and talking and stuff, she loves it. And the fans were what she was all about. And she went through, I mean, whatever the fan request was, she did her best to get it, including, like, taking a shirt over to Ringo's house and, or a pillowcase, having him sleep on it, to uh, collecting hair after they got their hair cut. I mean, there were a lot of, like, really strange things. But um, she just knew how important it was to the fans to honor their request because she was a fan, too. She saw the Beatles, what, 100 Ninety some times at the cavern, and wow. um, yeah, she was just a, a regular at the at the cavern. She's a cavernite, but um, I think she would be totally surprised if this thing takes off. And we just have to tell her that Niall is going to think you're the biggest superstar on the face of the earth if this thing comes off. And and it, we we try to tell her how much she mattered that people, her name is synonymous with the Beatles and the Beatles fan club. And like I said, she was the link. And she really did matter to these people, to the to the members of the fan club. So it would be wonderful if that happened. We should also mention there is a, the film has a website, um, www.goodolfrida.com, that has um, information about the film and also has – News on the um, on the screenings um, as they are now, and I, I expect that'll be updated if the if the uh, new film festivals are added. Is that is that right, yes. uh, Kathy? We'll update, yes, we'll um, update the, that. We have a Facebook page, and people are we're hoping this thing will actually go viral and that people will keep sharing it because that's that's how things happen anymore. So the more we put or things that we put on Facebook, people are just sharing them like crazy. So we want everybody to know about it because it is a beautiful film about a woman who did so much for so many of us out there. I mean, I, I have my little letter from Frida Kelly, too. <laughs> so. Wow. You yeah. do? Tell us that story. When did, when did you get that? <laughs> Gee, I was probably, must have been 18 at the time or something, but of course, everybody wrote to the fan club and asked for right. autographs. And you know, one thing about Frida too that I think Beatle fans will appreciate: she's never talked about all this or capitalized on it. And when the fan club ended, she could have packed up all that stuff and just stuck it in her attic and bring it out another day. But she personally gave it away to individual fans. And if she had all that stuff now, she could be a very wealthy lady. But mm. instead, she gave it away because she felt it belonged with the fans. That was all about. So I thought that wow. was just Wow. Especially you what after the fan club was. ended, she could have easily have cashed that in with a book, mm -hmm. you know, on a tour. Mm-hmm. Very easily. That's one of the, the, the real interesting things about the story that, that uh, like you say, she she – resisted she was hesitant about putting her story out and that it's taken us this long to get it but it's you know it's it's one of the, it's one of the great stories of the beatles and and the whole thing when we talked a couple of weeks ago and I'll, and but i asked you about whether or not um there was going to be beatle music or the beatles themselves if paul and ringo were going to be in, uh involved has anything happened that you can say about that here um, nothing's happened yet. We're still hopeful. We're still negotiating. We have not been turned down. Uh, okay. Which is positive in itself. And uh, we're very, very hopeful that we'll be able to get the music, but we just don't know yet. Hopefully soon, because the film's <laughs> quite quite near to being finished. What, as soon as your... it happens, we'll put it out there. You said you, t you had told me that that um, as far as South by South by Southwest goes, there is really no drop dead deadline for something like this. If in fact you know you get their permission, we hope they would let us, you know, redo the film. If you know, right now Ringa, you know, we would love to interview them, and we have 
requests in, and we're just waiting on those three things. We're waiting on the music, and we're waiting on the two interviews. But if if the interviews happened, we would go the next day, you know, right? And just and just do it because that would be wonderful. You know, it would be wonderful because she, you know, be a way for them to show their respect for for Frida. And it's a question we get asked frequently, like. Are they in the film? You know what? Are, they, are, mm-hmm. are, Paul, are Paul and Ringo in the film? And we, and when we say no, fans are kind of a little surprised, and they go, "Well, why not?" And we say, "Well, you know, they're, you know, here, there, and everywhere, and it's it's difficult to get through." But we know at this point we're just waiting, and just we really hope that they do it because it would make it even that much more special to hear it coming from their own mouth. You know, right. I'm sure they've got great stories too. They'd probably embarrass her, but you know, <laughs> they'd be great stories. What would be a really cool thing, although I, it's probably shooting the moon to even suggest this, is have Frida with them. You know, um, getting them together in like a reunion. That would um, be nice. Yeah. yeah, it really would. That would be get your hankies out, folks. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that would be. That's oh God! Uh, we would be crying, and they would be cracking jokes the whole time. Probably. Yeah. Do you know well, if Paul or Ringo have contacted Frida at all about this? I don't really know. I don't know, to be honest. I don't want to say yes and then have that be the wrong answer. I I don't know what she's done with either one of them, and and I don't poke into that, you know. Okay. You don't know that they've had any contact over the years at all, then? Oh, over the years they have, but oh, okay. I'm, I'm not sure in the past year or the past month or, you know, like that I don't, oh, okay. I don't press read on that. Okay. But after the Beatles breakup, they kept in touch? Um, they did for a while, uh, and but then up in Liverpool and they're all over the place, and I don't honestly know how much contact they've had over the years. I know they've been in contact, but I don't know, you know, if they just pick up the phone and call each other or, or what. You'll have to ask free to that. <laughs> okay. Oh, we will. <laughs> you ask her. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll, we'll ask her. So, again, that link, if you want to make a donation to help with the cause here for the film, you have to go to the website of southerndocumentaryfund.org. And then type in the name in the name search there of Good Old Frida. It's under Works in Progress, and it says Good Old Good Old Frida is in that list. So if you mm-hmm. look under Works in Progress and you go to uh, and you click down to Good Old Frida, it's there. So. Well, thanks so much to both of you too for having me on and uh, spreading the word and helping us. And uh, very nice to meet you, Ken. Big admirer of you. And- of course, Steve has been amazingly helpful all along, too. The, you're welcome. Uh, you're welcome. Lots of articles. Good support. Thank you so much. Oh, you're it's welcome. great to have you on the show, and we hope to run into you at one of these festivals. I yep. hope so. <laughs> Is there any chance that you'll be at any of the, the Fest for Beetle fans? Yes, I'll, I'll be there in, uh, I think it's the first weekend in April. Oh, oh so you're going to be in New York. Okay. Uh-huh. And, yeah. And I even, I even might be, too. Who knows? We'll oh, see. Oh, good. How about so, you, Ken? Oh, yeah. He, he will be. On, on, uh, Sunday. Oh, wonderful. Well, we'll have to find each other, and uh, I'll bring you up to date on what's going on. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for being You're welcome. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. <laughs> Draw, as they say. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. If you want to get a hold of us, um, You can get a hold of Ken on uh, his website, uh, www.kenmichaelsradio.com. You can find me uh, on uh, examiner.com under Beals Examiner, George Harrison Examiner, Paul McCartney Examiner, and Wrinkle Star Examiner. We both have our own pages on Facebook under our names. The show has a, a page on Facebook under Things We Said Today that you can find the show on iTunes and on podbean.com. um, and and we're all over the place and, and we also have an email address, things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. If you want to write us and have, give us suggestions or comments or criticisms or whatever you wanna or money, I don't know. <laughs> or 
CDs or let's, whatever. Let's not turn this into soupy sales here. No, let's not. Let's <laughs> not. So for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels, by Steve Marinucci, saying thanks so much for listening. See you next time.